what to do about these barriers? We who are already there must pull others in by recruiting and mentoring. Many women's organizations, politicized by the issues they care deeply about, are actively supporting women who support their issues. But I think we should be careful not to automatically support any woman against any man. In an interesting book, Sex Roles in the State House, the author Irene Diamond reminds us that despite the many generalities and case histories she cited, all women are not the same and are in the legislature for different reasons with different agendas. So the voters must look at them as individuals, not just women, and check their voting records as they should with any candidate. Which leads me to another interesting article on gender in colleges by Judith Shapiro, an anthropologist and president of my, alum, of my college, Barnard College. She says, the idea that women's colleges can all be lumped together as compared to men's colleges are seen, are, uh, as compared to how men's colleges are seen, is a reflection of gender stereotyping. It is part and parcel of seeing women as being less complex, less differentiated, and less fully cultural than men. Think for a moment about expectations many people have that women should be supportive of women political candidates in general as if there were no significant and highly consequential differences between, for example, Christine Whitman and Ann Richards. We need not and should not do this by homogenizing women as a category. She also cites Carol Gilligan, who describes the differences between two types of moral reasoning which separate men from women. One revolves around the concept of individual rights, the male side, and the other about the concept of responsibilities and relationships, which is the female side. But these differences are not in a vacuum. They are determined by the cultural systems in which they exist. Therefore, they can change. These gender differences are accentuated as our culture tries to deal with the conflict between individual rights and the greater society good. The ongoing debates about property rights versus environmental regulations that are going on right now in states and like courts and the federal government are examples of this tension. But Shapiro points out that there are more gendered issues than innate gender. They are more gendered issues, which is a word I never heard before, but it's a good word. She cites her studies in South America, where in two villages in Brazil, there are gendered divisions and labor of basketry. In one village, it is the men who make the more complicated and labor-intensive kinds of baskets. In the other, it is the women. There's a difference, yes, in who does what, but, but there is more than gender involved. There are the societal influences. She concludes, as we look at the great variation in the roles played by men and women in different societies, we become aware of the <clears throat> arbitrariness of our social arrangements. The differences are not inevitable. They could have turned out differently, and, and they still may. Actually, the subject of Shapiro's article is worthy of a lecture in itself, and I may have dwelt on it too long, but as I read it, I realized it dovetailed with all the questions asked of me. Are women in office different from men, and, and why? And how? Will they change once they gain power? Will we ever have a woman governor in South Carolina or a woman president? This past week produced the exciting news that three women had been sworn in as their country's presidents. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in Liberia, the first woman to preside over an African country, vowed to attack the corruption that lay beneath the recent bloodshed and despair in her nation. In Chile, President Bachelet was pro propelled to power by voters who were weary of machismo politics and corrupt leaders. And Angela Merkel, Germany's first female chancellor, leaped to power after the present chancellor was cut down by scandal. Where trouble and corruption hang in the air, voters around the world are increasingly turning to women. Golda Meir and Indira Gandhi also took over when violence and struggles were overwhelming. Someone I talked about this talk 
would say, well, why didn't you mention Margaret Thatcher? And I said, well, she's in a class all of her own. A while back, I would have said if asked, that Southern women were passive about politics, leaving such complicated and unpleasant things for the men to take care of. But that was before I read a book called The Southern Lady, From Pedestal to Politics, which describes the time when Southern women took the lead in not only seeing the need for political action, but taking it. That was during the stressful period at the end of the Civil War, when there was extreme, extreme poverty and the loss of so many men. It was when women who were left with the responsibility for the health and welfare of the slaves, new changes had to be made. They saw the need for schools and health services and libraries. The action started with a small circle of Methodist church women who began to meet with other circles and then spread across the South. I guess you'd call that networking. They actually wrought change. They were joined by the Women's Temperance League, who fought for the women's right to vote, I guess to gain votes for prohibition, but anyway, they were trying to get them to vote. In 1892, the South Carolina Equal Rights Association was formed to fight for women's suffrage. I came to the happy conclusion that the progressive movement of South Carolina was started by women, proving that the role of women can change as societal needs change. I'll close with some thoughts of Deborah Tanner in her book, Talking Nine to Five, in which she analyzes the differences between what men and women say. She is careful to say there aren't inherent or immutable gender differences, nor is there a single pattern for all men and all women. She speaks rather of a culture of genders. Tanner's hear, Tanner hears men saying I and women saying we, men focusing on status, women on connection, men comfortable with confrontation, and women preferring consensus. This surely describes the differences that I found while in politics. The question is, will women become more like men when they gain power, or will they change politics to reflect more of the positive feminine traits that Tanner describes. I don't think we we'll really know until women in powerful positions become a critical mass. I hope we'll see that happen before too many years go by. Thank you.